So in today's show, we're going to talk more about blood testing for metabolic health above and beyond just looking at glucose. We're going to focus on the importance of looking at non-fasted triglyceride and insulin assessments. Now, this is really important because oftentimes when you get your annual physical or you go get a requisition from some online uh, resource that enables you to do blood testing or uh, blood work, there's a recommendation that you fast for 12 to 14 hours prior to getting your blood drawn. Oftentimes when you leave the doctor, that's the last thing the medical assistant or nurse will tell you to do is make sure you fast, right? But we have to realize that most people are not in a fasted state for a significant portion of the day. Now, some of you may be doing 16-8 intermittent fasting or time-restricted feeding and so forth, so you're different from the average American or average person, but you need to realize that even in that state, eight hours of the day, you're in a postprandial period where you had a meal and your blood levels of fats, for example, triglycerides can increase. And that is independently associated with increased risk for cardiovascular disease. If there is a, a supraphysiologic postprandial rise in your blood triglycerides, we know that to be true with glucose as well. And so that's why doctors will recommend the glucose tolerance test for people who might be at risk for gestational diabetes and or uh, have signs of prediabetes. And so there's this new trend in terms of cardiovascular disease risk assessment at looking at and emphasizing the importance of non-fasted triglyceride assessment. So I want to share with you some recently published studies in my own non-fasted blood work. We're going to look at my own blood test and as you can see, you know, what my blood chemistry analysis is in the non-fasted state. I got my labs tested last week after I had an 80 gram fat meal. I waited about two hours. I probably should have waited three and a half, four hours, but you know, anyway, we can look at that and compare that. And I think this really can help people better understand whether or not they should be on a ketogenic diet, a low carb, high fat diet, or if they should be having bulletproof coffee or a lot of excess butter and so forth in their foods or bacon and so forth. This can help custom tailor the amount of fat content that you have in your diet and also give you a better insight into your fat tolerance. And so one of the papers that we're going to talk a lot about and draw some clinical insights from today, which was published in the Journal of Nutrition Science in 2019, the title of the article is Fasting, Non-Fasting, and Postprandial Triglycerides for Screening Cardiometabolic Risk. The authors say that there may be a distinct advantage of postprandial triglycerides, even over non-fasting triglycerides, for early detection of cardiovascular disease risk and other suggestions to make postprandial protocols more clinically feasible. Okay, so they say, despite triglycerides historically being measured in the fasted state, as I mentioned, most doctors say, hey, Sally, before you do your blood work, make sure you don't have any food for 12 to 14 hours which in all honesty, that has given you a false representation about your labs because most people never fast for 12 to 14 hours. I, I know some of you might, but m the average person does not do that. And so the rise in triglycerides following a meal, also known as postprandial lipemia, has been increasingly examined due to epidemiological evidence that non-fasted triglycerides are a strong independent predictor of cardiovascular disease and in some cases more closely linked with risk than fasting triglycerides, okay? So essentially what they're saying here is fasting triglycerides don't give us the, the best picture. We need to sort of stress test the body. And that's why there's a sort of stress test that we've, like I already mentioned, the glucose tolerance test, giving people a bolus amount of glucose, seeing what happens in the post-glucose administration window to both glucose and insulin. Is there a super physiologic re insulin response or a dramatically exacerbated uh, post-meal glucose uh, response? And also for cardiovascular stress testing, you're not testing people's EKG and so forth when they're sleeping or meditating. You're challenging someone on a treadmill and seeing what happens to the heart when it's under strain or stress. And that's similar, uh, that similar uh, process is, is the way that we should be evaluating the postprandial triglyceride levels because we know that independent of other factors, triglycerides are actually a as much or more of a risk factor than just LDL cholesterol. And they're closely and inversely associated with HDL cholesterol. We know HDL is involved in reverse cholesterol transport. There's antioxidant enzymes, um, uh, all sorts of, of favorable processes and, and cardiovascular um, disease risk reduction processes linked with HDL cholesterol. So there is this inverse relationship here. And so some, some sort of cut points that you need to be aware of. You know, most people that are physically active, doing some sort of intermittent fasting protocol, time-restricted feeding protocols, and eating a, a not 
excessive amounts of processed foods, their triglycerides should be in the, I think, under 80 milligrams per DL. I mean, that's just my sort of, when I'm working with clients, you know, the, the risk factors start to increase in a fasted state of triglyceride levels around 80 milligram, milligrams per DL. Now, in the postprandial or non-fasted state, your blood triglyceride should not go over 220 milligrams per DL. And all these cut points and so forth, by the way, we talk a lot about this in our Bloodwork Masterclass. Our upcoming live call for this winter is the 22nd of February. That's Tuesday, February 22nd. So I'll put links in the description below. You can check that out. We talk a lot about iron overload, uh, fasting versus non-fasting insulin, triglycerides, glucose. We talk a lot about immune health, uh, hormones, DHA, much more. Very detailed, comprehensive course about all things blood testing and blood work. So I'll put links below, check that out. Um, but what we're trying to look at here in, in considerations going forward for you, if you want to assess your metabolic health, you might be saying, well, why should I consider testing metabolic health? Well, we've shared various studies over the past several years that have shown that there's a huge decline in metabolic health amongst Americans. An excess of 94% of American adults have some sort of poor cardiometabolic health. And only 3% of American men actually have sufficient cardiometabolic health. So there's a large percentage of us who are on the spectrum of metabolic syndrome and should take action prophylactically to prevent sudden cardiac death and blood clots and premature mortality from cardiometabolic disease. And so one another tool that we can use to assess cardiometabolic health is looking at postprandial triglyceride levels. And the cut point here, as I mentioned, is 220 milligrams per DL. Your postprandial or non-fasted triglycerides. And I'll share with you the details about how much fat you should have when you do uh, a lipid load test. You know, the numbers range between 80 grams of fat up to 110 grams of fat. Various studies have actually looked at this. And I say various, we're talking about a dozen or so that have actually I looked at this. This is a new trend. I think we're going to hear more and more about this. The first time I remember reading about this was in 2009. And since then, there's been a, a plethora of literature that have supported the clinical utility of emphasizing non-fasted triglycerides over fasted triglycerides. So again, what you want to do, practically speaking, once you have your baseline blood tests, you get your annual physical, you work with your doctor, uh, and so forth, and you you do your Chem 24 and CBC, right? So you're looking at, you know, your iron, your ferritin, your TIBC, you're looking at um, glucose, you're looking at insulin, ApoB to A1 ratio, everything that we have on the page one of our blood work cheat sheet that you can find at highintensityhealth.com right in the header. Just opt in, download that, bring that to your doctor before you do your annual physical. You want to look at the liver enzymes, liver health. We talk a lot about how the liver is the gateway to metabolic health. If your liver is starting to become infiltrated with fat and your liver enzymes increase, that is an indicator of poor cardio metabolic health and challenges there. You only have one liver, so take care of it. But what you want to do is after you have your non-fasted blood work, then the next time you do your blood tests, what you would, ideally what you would do is eat a meal that you might normally eat. Let's say for some of you, it's a, a lowish carb meal, maybe with some rice or some sweet potatoes or a little honey, but make sure that you have between 75 up to 105 grams of fat in that meal, depending upon your body weight. If you're over 200 pounds, you might want to have about, you know, 100, 105 grams of fat. But if you're 110, 120 pounds, maybe just have 75 grams of fat. So kind of consider that in context of your body weight. And then about three to four hours later, you're going to go and do your labs. And what you want to look at is your non-fasted triglycerides, the ApoB to A1 ratio, as well as insulin and glucose on that test to see what is happening in the post-meal window. As I mentioned, the cut points for an unhealthy post-meal triglyceride response would be a blood triglyceride level of 220 milligrams per DL. And that is in the nanomoles per liters, 2.48 nanomoles per liter. For those of you, I think Quest looks at this in nanomoles per liter and LabCorp looks at milligrams per DL. And so for those of you in the UK and other countries, that would be helpful. So uh, ideally it would be under that. Now, if it's over that, you might be considering, well, what do I do? What does that mean? Well, that means at this current moment, your metabolic health might be suboptimal and you might be experiencing an exacerbation or of an, an, a supra physiologic level of triglycerides quite frequently after you eat a standard meal that has, you know, a lot of fat in it. And so that might mean that you're on the path, you're on the trajectory of, a, of the spectrum of metabolic syndrome and poor cardiometabolic health. 
So then you say, well, what can I do? What can I do to prevent this? Well, uh, various studies, and I want to share with you um, this one right here. Uh, this is uh, going to be figure one in the um, reference that we talked about. So if you're just listening here, we're looking at the post-meal post triglyceride levels in young active versus young inactive and old inactive uh, adults. And what you see here is physically inactive people invariably have hypertriglyceridemia, elevated levels of triglyceride, both in the fasted state and the non-fasted state, as is uh, shown here. So being more physically active, walking after meals, taking a 10 to 15 minute walk, trying to embark on a resistance training program three to five days per week, work with a trainer, focus on compound lifts, squats, deadlifts, presses, pulls, rows, all of those things are going to be helpful, as well as periodic one to two days a week of a high intensity interval training program that would include explosive anaerobic uh, movements using high power output. So that's important to recognize. Now, I want to get to my own labs here, uh, but just share with you this image, figure four. And what you can see here is this is the elevation in blood triglyceride levels after the lipid load test. And what you're seeing here is they start to peak around hour four. And so ideally you would test your blood work. Again, maybe go to the lab three hours after you have the meal. And then if you have the meal or sorry, the blood work at, you know, hour three and three and a half hours after your meal, you're going to get to about the peak of your postprandial triglyceride levels. And ideally, they would be under 220 milligrams per DL. And you can start to see here. So um, uh, another, several studies have actually looked at, this, looked at the risk, the long-term risk associated with a over-exaggerated post-meal triglyceride response. One of them was the atherosclerosis risk in communities uh, study. This was the ARARC study. And they followed people for years and looked at, this was a 20-year study, but they did a liquid test meal that utilized a bolus amount of heavy whipping cream, ice cream, uh, chocolate syrup, and protein powder. So this was 105 grams of fat. And they did find uh, in women, particularly an elevated risk for uh, cardiovascular disease uh, in those who had an over-exaggerated post-meal triglyceride response. There was also this Norwegian country study involving 86,000 men and women between uh, the years, I think, of like 20 and 56 or something of that effect. And they found non-fasted triglycerides were associated with an increased risk of all-cause mortality and death from cardiovascular disease uh, in women, mostly. Uh, but the, the men statistically wasn't totally significant, um, which is quite interesting. But they did find an increased risk, particularly in women. So women... Uh, take take note here uh, and consider. So let's look at, at my blood work. And I just want to share with you the, the differences here. So I got labs last week, last Thursday, those non-fasted. And you can see here, my last results were November of 2021. So almost a year ago, 14, 15 months ago or so. And what you see here is my fasted triglycerides were, were 58. And then I had a, a 75 gram meal and of fat, sorry. And I went three hours, like two and a half hours after. I probably should have waited a little bit. Uh, and my non-fasted triglycerides were 187, which were considered high. But what's important to recognize here is my LDL cholesterol actually decreased, now slightly. Now that could have been related to other factors and so forth. But also you can see it did not impact my ApoB to A1 ratio, uh, especially comparing the fasted ApoB to A1 ratio compared to the non-fasted ApoB to A1 ratio and my uh, HDL cholesterol is about the same. I mean, within 3% three, uh, uh, 3 or so. You can see the glucose is a little bit higher, but not super physiologically higher. And the, the non-facet insulin was only, I think, 6 or 7 on that. So not alarming by any means, but um, this is the second time that I've done this. The first time I did this was in 2017. And at that point in time, I was doing a lot of bulletproof coffee, butter in the coffee, MCT oil, and all of that. And I found my triglycerides, they went up to 210. And so after doing, uh, seeing that firsthand, I really backed off on the Bulletproof Coffee and thought, you know what, I'm not going to have this bolus of liquid fat uh, in this format anymore. It's a treat uh, once in a you know, month or something. If a friend makes it for me, okay, fine. But I was doing several a day and realized that that's probably not healthy long term. Um, Again, I'm not a fat phobic person at all, but having a massive bolus of blood triglycerides and chylomicrons and so forth 
we know that the chylomicron absorption from the gut can uh, encapsulate uh, endotoxins or lipopolysaccharide from your gut bacteria. That can be pro-inflammatory, cause neuroinflammatory cascades in the brain, induce insulin resistance, all stuff that you don't want. And so you, you want to minimize this. And so um, that's, I think, the important thing to remember is um, these if you are having an over-exaggeration of these uh, post-meal triglyceride responses, that could be limiting your progress when it comes to improving body composition and metabolic health. So it's important to recognize this and just understand that just because your doctor says, well, we always do blood work non-fasted, doesn't mean that you have to do that. That is sure to get a baseline non-fasted, but also consider doing the lipid load test, as we talked about here, which is a bolus meal, mixed meal, Proteins, carbs, fats, but try to have uh, higher fats than maybe normal. 75 grams on if you're around 100 pounds up to, you know, if you're over 200, maybe consider like 105, 110 grams of fat uh, in that meal. Now, it's important, obviously, to test using the foods that you normally eat. You know, if you never eat fast food, don't go to McDonald's and get the triple bacon cheeseburger with french fries and so forth because you don't normally eat that. Most people would have an adverse response to having those fake foods. So it's important to test the foods that you habitually eat to see how your body is responding to them. So... I just thought that might be helpful for you. A tool that you may want to consider um, if you do have uh, cardiometabolic health risk factors uh, and you want to support your metabolic health is the berberine fasting accelerator. You can take two to three caps right before dinner or, or shortly after dinner. That is when you start your fast. That is time point zero for many people because you're going to bed. Uh, and then for most people, you're not eating until maybe 11, 12 o'clock. So berberine fasting accelerator can be a tool to be helpful uh, in that context. Consider to kickstart your fast. I'll put links over at myoscience.com. You can use the code to save podcasts at checkout. And also be sure to enroll in our Bloodwork Masterclass that is starting on the 22nd of February, the winter edition. We have two live calls and there's a bunch of videos in there where you can get started now to learn more about how to be more proactive about blood testing and blood work analysis in your life so that you can be more empowered and know what these trends uh, mean when you get your blood chemistry results so that you can stay on top of your longevity and metabolic health trajectories. So as always, my friends, thanks for tuning in. Thanks for hitting that like button. Thank you for leaving a comment and sharing this podcast and video, and we will catch you on a future one down the road. Have a great day. Bye now. Yeah.